Pagan Rome was the controlling government when the words I'm about to read to you were written. They were written to believers that had left the lifestyle of that pagan culture and were waiting for the same thing that you and I are waiting for today. Our passage in Scripture this morning is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for His Son from heaven. Now to understand the words of that passage, we first must identify the type of people that He's talking to that were waiting. Of course, these were redeemed people. I remember my, my family and an old church here in Tennessee that we would visit occasionally that would sing when the redeemed are gathering in, and some of you remember that old song, waiting for his son from heaven. Those who were waiting were not the pagan cultured people that were enamored with the gross immorality that was so available to their world system at that time, nor is it the type of people that are waiting for him in our world system today, uh, they're more warring against him as opposed to waiting for him. These redeemed people were people who had rejected the old life. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Of course, an idol is anything that has to do with taking the place of the true God. The city of Thessalonica was full of those idols, and every idol they had represented some form of lust, vice, or evil. It was then, as it is now, a pandemic of temptation pursuing believers. Paul wouldn't have written these words if it wasn't a battle for the believers to reject that old lifestyle, fulfilling your needs, your desires, your social status has always been offered by the world. A little chorus that we sing occasionally, I don't think we've sung it here, I sing it at home some. You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. These believers in the Roman city of Thessalonica had turned to God from idols. They had rejected the old life. High tech and social networking are offering more of this world's goods than ancient Rome could have ever known or imagined. And how difficult it is now to reject the old life. I recall many years ago listening to some missionaries from Africa talk. They said in the early days when they had first gone to Africa and preached to the tribes, they would tell about Jesus and, and then they would give an invitation and almost everyone would come forward. And they didn't understand at first what was going on, but these people had many gods. And when they were offered Jesus, they thought, well, here's another God. This is, this is a good one. We'll take him too. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. You have to reject the old life if you're ever going to receive the new life. You turn to God from idols. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Those Thessalonians had been slaves to the false and the dead gods. Now they were totally committed to the true and living God. The Roman system was filled with slaves. I've done some study about the ancient Romans. Almost no one ha had a job. Uh, it's kind of like what our government is trying to pursue these days. All the labor was performed by the Chinese, I mean by the servants. Our, so our society sees servitude as a curse. If you've got a job, that's a bad thing. You're a servant. You're working for someone. I've even heard some of the multimillionaire football players complain that they're slaves. 
because they're owned by the company. And so our society sees servitude as a curse. Our Lord himself said in Mark 10, 45, that he came to serve and not to be served. To serve is a privilege for the true believer. The questions are to whom or whom do we serve and why are you doing this service and what is the service that you're rendering? Paul goes right on to say that such a transforming experience had come through the, the risen Christ who had delivered and continued to deliver from the wrath to come. The present tense and the original emphasis emphasizes the, the glorious truth of an ever-present and powerful Savior saving us from sin, saving us from death, and saving us from judgment. I wonder if you have experienced this new life in Christ. Have you been saved? Now, I'm not asking if you're a member of the church or even if you attend on a regular basis, but have you ever been saved? Have you ever rejected the old life to receive the new one? Unless you can answer with an unqualified yes, then you are not one of those who are waiting for God's Son from heaven. In fact, nothing could be more terrible than the return of Christ, at least from the unbeliever's perspective. Those who, who, does not, those who do not know what it means to wait for God's Son from heaven. In explaining her conversion experience, a young woman once described it this way. She said, before I was saved, I was running after sin. Now I'm running away from it. True conversion involves both a, both a change involves both a change of attitude as well as direction. The redeemed ones are waiting. It's the type of people who are waiting. Then our trust, secondly, in God as we wait, our reliance on the power of God to wait. Wait for his son from heaven. Knowing he was about to leave this life, the Apostle Paul was still anticipating the return of Christ in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll read some of those verses beginning with verse 6. He said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. And then with a heavy heart, he added in verse 10, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. See the distinction? One loved the present world and the other loved his appearing. Life is brief at its very longest. Our short stay is but, but a test to determine if you are one of those who are loving His appearing, you know, it's one thing to say that we love Jesus. It's quite another to love His appearing and to eagerly await the day when we can look into His face and hear those words, Well done, my good and faithful servant. In the book of Job that we've been studying, discovering, uh, some things about Job. There was the disapproving of the devil's accusations on God's part. God allowed Job, Job to demonstrate that his love for God was not based on the blessings of God because all those were taken, taken away from him. He loved the God of blessings as opposed to the blessings of God. He loved the God of blessings to the extent that he could say toward the end of the book, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. We call it the patience of Job. The believers at Thessalonica were empowered with waiting patience. There was a purpose. Jesus said in Luke 19, 13, occupy or, or take care of business till I come. These words occur in the parable of the pounds and were used by our Lord to emphasize his call on Christian stewardship during his absence from his waiting church. 
The master expects us to invest everything we have in his business so that we cannot be ashamed before him at his coming. This purpose for our life concerns both our character and our service. If we truly love his appearing, we will occupy or we will take care of business till he comes. So there was a purpose, there was a passion. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Our Savior instituted a communion of remembrance to keep his people ever at the foot of the cross and identified with his redemptive passion. Paul in Philippians 3.10 writes, Oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Sometimes our suffering is punishment and sometimes our suffering is persecution. Paul's suffering with Christ was his passion. It is our privilege to be identified with Jesus in his redemptive concern for a lost world, winning people to Jesus. That's why communion reminds us of our call to share the Lord's passion till he comes. There was a purpose, there was a passion, and there was a power. In Revelation 2.25, our Lord told the church at Thyatira to hold fast what you have till I come the members of the church at Thyatira in Asia Minor were finding their loyalty threatened by the conflicting interest and pressures of their contemporary world. Thyatira was an industrial city politically influenced by the trade unions. And to be in business, you had to belong to a union. That sounds familiar to the stories my dad told me when he first moved to Detroit in 1949. The problem for the Christian was that any association with those trade unions inevitably meant eating meals dedicated to pagan deities and participating in unspeakable immorality and decadence, which was the highlight of their banquets. To be a believer in that day was to be a separated people who, could not, who would not compromise with the world. That is supposed to be the way it is these days. So the risen Lord appeared to his church and said, hold fast till I come. This message was the opposite of go along to get along. I'll never forget sitting in my high school library in the mid 60s, 60s reading about a book about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It had taken place 20 years earlier it was August the 6th, 1945, that an American B-29 bomber named the Enola Gay dropped the first atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. It was built right here in the state of Tennessee. Man's capacity to destroy himself was now a reality. The government of sinful man assumes power to control you and ultimately to destroy you. But there is a higher power. And the Lord said, hold fast till I come. The redeemed who wait, the reliance empowering them to wait, and then the return for which they wait, or the time that concludes our wait. Wait for his son from heaven. You know, the Bible shed some light on the time frame for when our waiting will come to an end. It will be a time when the church is full. And as we watch evangelical churches grow more and more empty and apostate churches grow more and more full, the truth is there's only one church. It's the church of the living God. And it is made up of individual members. These are born again people. And there's gonna be a day when that last member is born into the body of Christ. It's when the church is full. I'll read to you from Acts chapter 15, beginning with verse 14. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. 
I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up. That was James speaking at the first church council in Jerusalem. He was describing what God had revealed to Peter concerning the divine purpose for the opening and closing of the church age. It all began at Pentecost when the church was founded. Ever since then, the Spirit of God has been saving men and women from every nation under heaven throughout succeeding generations. There is a day, however, when the last person to become part of God's church is saved. After this, I will return, Scripture says. When the last believer is added to the body of Christ, Jesus will come again, and that could happen at any time now. So, the time concerning the concluding of our wait. It is when the church is full. Secondly, it is when the chapter is closed. Luke 21, 28, now when those things begin to happen, when these things begin to happen, Jesus said, lift, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. This was the Olivet Discourse. The events depicted are to be the prelude to the great tribulation which is going to be visited upon the Jews before they are delivered and restored to their Messiah. But long before that, the church will have been raptured by the coming again of Jesus for His saints. Jesus' words in Acts 1-7, It is not for us to know times or seasons which the Father has put in His own authority. These events preceding God's wrath are still yet to happen. But they're already beginning to show signs of what's going to happen. When the final chapter is closed, the Lord descends with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. That's in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. And also think about how that the chariots rage. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, Daniel 12, 4, Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. And then Nahum 2, 4, The chariots rage in the streets. They jostle one another in the broad roads. They seem like torches. They run like lightning. Now that was fulfilled in the overthrow of Nineveh, yet it pictures a type of what we see in our, on our interstates and highways these days, every single day. Well, now that... Gasoline is reaching $5 a gallon. That doesn't seem to matter. These tall pickup trucks still run at excessive speeds and act as if they're going to run over you. If you don't get out of their way, road rage is commonplace in our overstimulated culture. The chariots rage, <clears throat> contrails in the sky. They leave traces of where people are going to and fro at speeds exceeding 500 miles an hour. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. 97% of Americans have a cell phone, the majority of which are smartphones. Daniel 12, 4 says knowledge shall increase. 2 Timothy 3, 7 tells us that there will be a people always learning and never able to come to the, tr to the knowledge of the truth. So it appears that these days we are living among educated idiots. Then there's the charge of battle. Luke 21, 10, Then nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Russia is showing aggression that has been the subject of end-time discussion for some time now. China is actively expanding its war machine. North Korea and Iran are preparing for nuclear conflict and civil war is brewing right now in our own country. The charge of battle. And then... The fifth point that I would like to share with you quickly is the chosen people will return or regroup. Jeremiah 16, 14, Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that it shall no longer be saved, said the Lord lives who brought us, brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt, but the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where they had been driven, for I will bring them back into their land which I gave to their fathers." That took place in 1948, in our generation, in my generation, the baby boomer generation. And here's what Jesus said in Luke 21:29. Then he spoke to them a parable. 
Look, the fig tree and all the trees, when they are ready, they are already budding. You see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So you also, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. And I so wonder if the generation of 1948, the baby boomer generation, is what Jesus was talking about. In that tiny little nation of Israel, vast preparations are underway to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Even though blind to the fact that Jesus has already come as Savior, Orthodox Jews are awaiting what will prove to be His second coming. And Zechariah 12.10 says, And they will look on Him whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for Him. As these things are beginning to unfold before our eyes, the question is raised in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, What manner of persons ought you to be in all in holy conduct and godliness. These are the redeemed ones who wait. The reliance on God's power to be able to wait. And then the return of Christ for which we wait. It is the job of the preacher and the job of the church to warn people to flee from the wrath to come and to join in on this waiting as we watch the world about us completely fall apart. It is time for self-examination. Are you ready? And are you waiting? Let's pray. Now, Father in heaven, thank you for your word. It is true. The world does not accept it. The world rejects it as they reject our Savior. But the time is coming soon that he will return for his church. And the, the world will be in terrible chaos. And when he does return, the Jews will mourn for those, for that one that they pierced, the one they crucified. Dear Lord, help those who are pushing it a little bit too far right now. And they may be in a situation where they're not waiting for the return of Christ, but they're waiting for a better day to trust Jesus. And that day may never come. Help them be re to be ready now, to receive Jesus now, to reject the world now, and to wait for the return of our blessed Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.